The Local Youth Worker is a podcast brought to you by Reformed Youth Ministries. Since 1972, RYM has sought to reach and equip youth for Christ. And this podcast seeks to reach and equip those parents and youth workers who share that same desire. For more information on our student conferences, youth leader training, or resources, visit rym.org. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Local Youth Worker, a podcast brought to you by Reformed Youth Ministries. I'm your host, John Parrott. This is episode 377, and I'm here with Chris Holland. Chris, how's it going? Going well. Um, Chris and I just recorded an interview, um, but it's going to be out of sequence. So we were talking pre-recording, trying to figure out <laughs> who's going to be up next. Um, I think it's going to be Brian Habig continuing to talk about insecurities of life and ministry. And then Reagan Rose will be joining us later talking about his newest book, Redeeming Productivity. Um, but the interview we just recorded was talking about uh, the track booklet, um, A Student's Guide to Womanhood. Um, Chris, have you been able to utilize any of the track booklets in your ministry at all? Yeah, I mean, aside from my own daughter reading this one on womanhood uh, with to me in the car, uh, yeah, we give them a like uh, they. It's it's one of the easiest, simplest books to give away to parents uh, who are busy because of their short and precise. And I think you've heard you've said this before. It is so hard to write short and precise books on given topics because there's now with, with the internets and the interwebs, you, you got, you, you can pretty much every reference, everything, everything you'd ever want to know about a particular topic is out there. And it's hard whittling down all of those details down to just the most concise specific things. And, and the track series does that really, really well in a very quick way that matches the speed of our culture generally. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, it's something that we definitely, we wanted to be theologically rich uh, booklets, but accessible, you know, they're written for students and then also just, you know, accessible from the standpoint of they're not big. They don't look intimi- intimidating. So they're, they're small booklets. Uh, those who are tuning in and have no idea what we're talking about, this is a booklet series that RYM has partnered with Christian Focus Publications to put together. Um, we currently have 12 books, um, and the, the titles of those are Students' Guide to Sanctification, to Technology, to Anxiety, Students' Guide to Navigating Culture, um, Students' Guide to the Power of Story, uh, glorification, depression, gaming, justification, and then the most recent, uh, womanhood, worldview, and then missions. Um, so 12 titles. Uh, we're working on the next three. We release three every six months or so. Uh, so the forthcoming ones will be A Student's Guide to Apologetics, uh, to Social Media, and then to Dating, Marriage, and Sex, I think is going to be the the title on that one. So those will be coming out in, in January, but, um, we definitely want to, you know, point parents to these point youth workers to these they are all on Amazon. They're three ninety nine for the most part. Um, but Chris, I think you said you've been able to give them out to parents pretty consistently. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, we've really changed the way that we do book reviews or read books in small groups and with parents. And I, I tell parents don't read a chapter a, a week or in one sitting, uh, read one little section, you know, because they're usually broken by a topic and then, you know, you have maybe three or four paragraphs, read it. And just according to that, don't feel like you got to do chapters. Don't feel like you got to go through it super fast. Really chew on it and think on each piece of the puzzle. Um, and and then that's that's rendered a whole lot of good growth and conversation and insight. And I think uh, it's just you're really able to chew on things the way the author intended because the authors writing these things are generally chewing on these things a lot as they get like they work really hard on this stuff um so that you can get the best of what they've discovered um and the truths that they've mined from scripture um into your hands i mean they've worked really really diligently on it i haven't heard one negative comment about any of these books except you know i've just heard good things that it's they're really thinking in a way that my kid can understand. And a lot of parents actually 
are not reading theology, <laughs> right? <laughs> like a lot of parents just are. They're not reading these a lot of th- these things, even in their own small groups at churches. They're just too busy. Mm-hmm. But so, giving them something that is really m- meant for a middle schooler or a high schooler uh, has been really effective, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, even if you're an adult, you know, needing something to to really get a deeper under it's almost like a systematic theology series um Mm -hmm. towards youth is really what it is and if you really want to get back in track i mean i'd say take one of them per you know month or two and if you do a quiet time every day just take one section or one paragraph and just read it slow Mm -hmm. and glad that you did yeah yeah and and to that point i mean i've heard from a lot of adults who have said they just appreciate it because yeah they can they can read them very easily and and quickly and you know as i already said we're recording this out of a sequence but i yeah didn't even think about the fact that reagan rose will be on later and he wrote a student's guide to gaming and so we'll we'll reference that as well um i do want to remind our listeners about the deal that they can get through crossway books um, RYM has partnered with Crossway. Uh, if you go to crossway.org slash RYM40, uh, you can get 40% off of uh, selected titles. Um, there's some in kind of the youth and family ministry, but then some outside of that as well from also just uh, Bibles, uh, pocket Bibles, to study Bibles. Um, but it's 40% off of uh, around 50 titles or so, maybe a little bit more. And this is for a limited time. So I want to encourage everyone over the, I think maybe, the next few weeks this will be ending so be sure to to jump on again crossway.org slash rym40 to get 40 percent off and just say thanks again to our, our friends at crossway for now here is brian habig All right, we are back with uh, Brian Habig and Kurt Cooper. We're finishing up our discussion talking about insecurities of life and ministry. Um, I know last week we were talking a little bit, Kurt, you asked something along the lines of, you know, are there areas where you can kind of, you know, be more vulnerable or kind of let your hair down, so to speak? Um, Brian, you responded saying you married that person, uh, that being your wife, Dana. Um, just talking about that, those kind of safe spaces for, for ministers, uh, where are some of those areas, maybe some counsel advice on being able to, um, yeah, have, have these safe p- places where you can speak more openly. Well, I'll, I'll recommend a resource that, uh, came out recently in by faith online by faith, you know, publication of the PCA, Walter Henniger, who is a pastor in Atlanta, did a piece about the past, the pastor's need for pastoral friendship. Mm-hmm. And he, he sets it up anecdotally about he's just, he, he, you know, he needs someone to talk to. He just looks up and just all these people he had in his life, they, they left the church or they betrayed him or there was a misunderstanding. They just can't be friends they used, the way they used to be. And he sits down with the counselor and the counselor recommends that I think you need to be friends with some other pastors. And he said, he said, when he heard that answer, he started mentally shopping for another counselor. But <laughs> he, it, but but it's really well written. It's not a long piece, but I, especially for anyone listening who's um, serves as a pastor or um, youth minister, it's relevant to more than that. But in my own life, I, I do have some, you might say, some infrastructures of friendship. I I have a friend in town that I have breakfast with every uh, week. Uh, more often than not, we had breakfast this morning. And you know, it's like the way friendship and relationships go, even like maybe time with your children or a spouse. It's not like you can say, we will have super deep, meaningful connectional time from one fifteen to 2.15. You, you log time together and then every once in a while, lightning strikes, you know, and, mm-hmm. it, and, it's, and it's magic. So, yeah, that's kind of how our breakfasts are. They're never bad, but sometimes there's just real, real just gold. Mm-hmm. That's that's a friend in town. I have other friends in town, couple friends, uh, and I have a very very close friend from more from uh, growing up, kind of from high school days, and we talk on the phone uh, at least every other day. And it's some I mean, just seamlessly move from the mundane and ridiculous to the theological to the family challenge to the whatever, just talk about the gamut. And and with all of those, again, I never feel like I, quote, take my pastor hat off. I, 
I took a vow to be a minister all the time, and and uh, and you know, I mean, it's such a great privilege, and there's great joy in it. But James does say that, hey, those who teach will be judged more strictly. I don't want that to be like a giant sword, you know, over my head. But but it's true. I took a vow to live with exemplary piety. I don't live up to that all the time, but. I'm, I, I'm, ne I'm like, sorry for the double negative, but I'm never not to be an example. Mm. I'm never not to be an example. So I think I've got friends where I can be honest, be myself, talk about failures, uh, talk about frustrations. Um, it's really just been in the last maybe four years that I got into counseling. And I don't go as frequently as I did a few years ago, but... Uh, I got in because I was just really tired and depressed and couldn't think my way out of it and um, needed somebody to be very honest with. I actually was telling a person that I see for counseling um, a, a lot of what we're talking about. We were talking, uh, they were asking me about the pressures of being a minister. And, uh, but before we leave what, uh, before I share any of that, what I want to say is uh, you were talking about how you can go seamlessly between the mundane and the theological with your good friend. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can't like schedule that quality time. There's a guy that has in the past has played organ for our church. He's an amazing man named Ed Patterson. Um, and I don't think he'd mind me name checking him here, but um, he always told me uh, that when he was burning the candle at both ends professionally, that he told himself with his daughters, I'm just going to do quality time, not quantity time. And uh, this was years later after his, one of his daughters had passed away very from cancer at a very young age. Hmm. Uh, and in the wisdom of that, as he looked back on it, he said, Kurt, there is no quality time without quantity time. That doesn't exist. He said, right. that's a lie that you can, which is, you know, I just, um, I've never forgotten that. I can tell you exactly where I was standing when he said it, you know, I was obviously clued into what he had to say and I respect him a great deal, but, you know, it just reminds you, you got to do that. I tell my small group leaders that, you know, when I hand them a group of junior high girls or boys, I'm like, these kids are going to be silly and awkward and weird. They're the most awkward and the most weird that they've ever been right now. And I said, and you're going to be like, what, are, what am I doing with these kids? You know, like I can barely get one small group question in before they're, you know, giggling or making fart noises or whatever. And I said, I always tell them that quote from Ed Patterson. I say, You've got to do the quantity to get the quality. Um, and there's a lot of people who've said that more wisely than I have. But Brian. bringing it back to being a minister for a second, um, you know, I think I've actually thought about this a lot, but there's this, there is this sacred secular distinction when you are a minister and you've got like the Roman Catholic side of it where, you know, you don't have a family and you go into the priesthood and you're completely separate. And, you know, I'll never forget my wife and I were visiting some family friends and they, that one of them had to be Roman Catholic. And we just had our first child and we were talking about how difficult it was because he'd scream the whole way there. And uh, the Roman Catholic priest said, Oh, it couldn't have been too bad. It's just an hour. And I mean, I want to say, well, what do you know about it? But um, you have no idea what you're talking about. Um, and I'm not bashing Roman Catholics here. I'm just saying he doesn't have any kids. So there's that side of it. That's that spectrum. And we can edit all this out if somehow, you know, the Pope comes for me, but um, on the other side, you've got, you know, I guess Protestants where we're living our lives and, you know, we have families and we're kind of, even though we're supposed to be set aside and different, we're kind of separate. We're not separate. We're kind of in the midst. Our kids are playing rec soccer and we're doing the Cub Scouts or the Boy Scouts or whatever, you know, and, and it's like, maybe that there is some wisdom in being separated. And I mentioned this offline and Brian said it was really wise. So I'm going to say it again, but maybe there was wisdom in the fact that the Levites were their own tribe mm. and that they were that they, you know, when you look at how the tabernacle was set up as the tabernacle, then the Levites were on all four sides and they kind of surround, but they were their own situation. And that speaks to what you're talking about, Brian, that you got to have people who understand what it's like to be in your shoes to really relate to you um, and can really speak that wisdom into your life. And, you know, so you need those minister friends um, and those are hard to develop because, yeah. 
I don't know, maybe you can talk more about that because I'd be interested to know what like a church planner thought about this because as a youth minister, there are other youth ministers in this town and we get together sometimes and talk about stuff, but we're so immersed in what we're doing at our individual churches. It's kind of hard. You really have to be aggressive to really develop those relationships. So I, I don't know if it's any different when you're a church planner and, and how that works, but I'll let you talk about that for a second. Well, I, I, it's hard to remember back. There's some things I can remember about that, you know, from, from years back. I mean, it's weird because I'm into my 18th year now and I'm not saying it's ancient history, but I'm just, I'm in a, I'm in a different chapter now. It's an established church. Uh, and we, you know, got, got our problems too. And I've got my mm-hmm. insecurities now too, but, uh, but you know, one thing I've built into my life that, that wasn't there before, I guess maybe as a church planner, I didn't feel like I had the latitude to do this, but I was really impacted by, um, did y'all see that book that came out a few years ago called Atomic Habits by James Clear? Mm-hmm. You seen that book? Mm-hmm. There was and, zero chance that that John had not seen that book, by the way. When you said, have y'all seen that book? I was, I would have bet my life that John yeah. had seen it. So anyway, <laughs> probably knows the author. Keep going. Right. Well, um, I mean, I, you know, it's not the end all be all, but a, just a point from that book that I keep quoting to myself and to other people is that he says that we do not rise to the level of our goals. We fall to the level of our systems. And, and, and that's as real as, hey, that's awesome if you're a youth minister and you feel like, man, I really want to connect more with kids that are not in the church, that are not Christians. But that, like, that's kind of a, a, a vague goal. It's a different thing to say, on Fridays, I only go do something with a kid that's not in the church or I know is not a Christian. Like, just that's a system built in. That's different. So for me, uh, generally, I try on Tuesdays to have lunch with another pastor. And it might be one in my denomination in the area, and there's, there's quite a few in the area, so I get to catch up with them and, you know, like just have more face-to-face time besides just seeing them, you know, seeing them at Presbytery or General Assembly. But but also getting together with pastors that are not from my background, that are not Presbyterian. And it's really great because I think with the the less I know them, the first few minutes, they can sort of be in the gear of what is this about? Like, why are we doing this? Are you about to tell me some program that you want us to partner with you or you're about to invite me to something that I'm supposed to financially support. And when you give them runway just to be themselves and talk, and, and I would want that pastor to keep his pastor hat on too, but like, but no, I'm talking to you man to man, human to human. Those are those, I, I really like that. I like that rhythm in my life. I'm not saying it's the perfect way to do it, but, but that's been like a system for me that I need it. And I think in some way they, they need it. And the tyranny of the urgent crowds it out. So maybe I can help somebody else have more of that in in their okay. life. Yeah. And look, with the little bit of time we have left, I'd love for us to talk. I mean, we've been dipping in and out of insecurities and things like that. And also some some helpful ways to, to deal with those. Um, I know... You know, we're all, everyone is dealing with insecurities on some level. Everyone is dealing with certain fears, which means we're, we are trying to, um, you know, fix those in unhealthy ways or deal with those in unhealthy ways. And so some of those we might not even be aware of, uh, some of those subtle ways in which we try to deal with those. And so I'd love for, I mean, both of you, you, you can speak to this. What are some, some ways that you've observed or even in your own life um, unhelpful ways that you're dealing with your insecurities, but then also some some helpful ways. Uh, Brian, some some thoughts on that? Well, you, you know, I probably should have mentioned this earlier, but so a couple of sessions back, you were asking about when I first did some of this material, and John, you, you had heard it in that form when I spoke at T4G 12 years ago. And the original title that I had for this breakout session was the insecurities of the minister. And I wasn't trying to be jargony. I just, that's just how it came out. And it actually was changed to the fears of the minister. CJ Mahaney was part of T4G and he asked that it be changed. And the reason he said was because the Bible doesn't really talk about insecurities. It talks about fears. It talk, you know, it name it names it that way. So let's give it that name. So I just, I want to acknowledge that, that insecurities isn't meant to be overly therapeutic, but it's just, I think that's a term that we 
that we talk about. You could say fears either way, but uh, I, I, I would say one big one, and this just may seem like this is what the minister is supposed to say, but I really do believe this, is to really have a life of secret prayer, um, maybe what Christians back in the day might call a life of the closet, and to, to be a person of the Word. And I know it's, you know, for Christians, it's never a bad idea to say, yeah, we need more of the Bible, we need more prayer. But, but you know, the, there, there is a good fear that drives out the bad fears. And the only life-giving fear I know is the fear of God. And it, and it can be awe, and it can be a joyful, you know, whatever the, whatever the Pevensey children felt with Aslan, it really can be that. But it, it better be a big fear to drive out the fear of um, the domineering parent of a youth group member or the opinionated elder who wants to tell you what the youth group needs to do or the, you know, whatever. Um, I do have to say, by the way, I, I'm, I'm, I feel very, very, very blessed with the elders that we have. And so in, in, in some ways... I'm not speaking out of like, you know, I'm not giving you war stories about what I did about this difficult elder or that because I, I've just, we've been very blessed with godly men who've been very supportive of me. I, I do want to say that. But to, to cultivate that, you know, that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Um, I think it's Zechariah, John the Baptist father, when when he, you know, finally gets his speech back and he sings the song that he, you know, he sings about that the Messiah is going to bring the fear of the Lord back. And so to cultivate that in the word and in prayer and in worship, but I think also um, to, to maximize family and friends. I don't mean use them, but man, you know, when you know that this spouse, this child really loves me, to not hang your identity on that, but to remember that I, I, like if my child loves me and a parent or a deacon is frustrated with me, I, let's have a sense of proportion about what's loud on my insides. Hmm. And I tend to not do good at that. I mean, you know, like I, 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 10 encouragements will leak out of me like a bucket. <laughs> it's leaky. And one mildly critical point will just will be like Velcro for two weeks. Um. Counseling, certainly, to get objectivity about oneself. Um, back to friends. It's great to have friends that are strong where you're weak. Like some people, when they have, when there's some interpersonal problem or conflict, that, you know, like some people, their instinctive response is, oh no, what's my deal? And some people are like, what's their deal? I'm so what's my deal? What did I do wrong? Why is this my fault? That I need friends in my life who are good at, what, what is their deal? Just to give me objectivity when I'm churning about, you know, conflict or mistakes or whatever. Is that answering your question? 100%. Yeah, okay. that, that's very good. And I know we're, we're about to draw this to a close, but Kurt, you've got something. Well, you mentioned it because you mentioned your children, but this kind of goes back to what we were talking about beforehand, but, and about living, I don't want to say living in a fishbowl, but the, you know, the vulnerability of the fact that you get up and pastor and you preach in a pulpit and how people look at you differently and how that's the appropriate sides of that. And also maybe the problematic sides, but I was just wondering, you know, how you take that and apply it and or try to shield your children from that you know you you you've raised you have three children am i correct you have three children that's that's right and and you've raised three children in the church and i guess you know how old is henry i know he's your oldest but he's he's an engineer he's out of the house he's 22 he's 22 but he, so he was 10 when you gave this talk correct right? so, and he so he so he's he was born in 2000 he's 10 so and I'm asking this for me as I am for anyone, because I'm a pastor and I have kids. And a lot of the people who listen to this are youth ministers who have children. But how, what, what, what wisdom and what, where have you learned from your mistakes in 
helping your children grow up in the church and not hate the church or hate the fact that they're in, you know, this special class. Um, I'd just like for you to talk about that for a second, because I'm keenly interested in it. Mm. Uh, It's something I think about all the time. Mm. Well, I could wax eloquent about mistakes. Uh, When I have, I would just know from my own children and from talking to other preachers, kids, one of the number one things I guess you can't say one of the number one things. The number one thing that I would (laughs) avoid is don't use them as examples when you're teaching. Mm. Unless, unless you you checked with, you know, checked and and got permission. But, and, and generally I do that. I don't put my children a lot in sermons or talks and when I was was going to use an example of a story, I would I would check. But there there's been a <laughs> there's been more than once where I didn't, and I just I just regret it. They did not like uh, they did not like that. So that's definitely one to avoid. But man, I just think is there an aroma in the home of the gospel that we're proclaiming? If we're talking about free grace and justification and adoption and welcome from up front and home feels like feels tight and overly restrictive and the default answer seems to be no and critique, they're just going to do the math after a while. Yeah. Um, no, that, that's a good word. And look, there's so much more to talk about, plenty to, to follow up there. Um, Brian, you've been very generous with your time. Thanks so much for, for coming on the podcast this last few weeks. Oh, thanks so much for having me, guys. It's good to, it's good to talk with you. Reagan, welcome back to the podcast. Hey, it's great to be here. Yeah, good, good to see you again. Um, you're kind of starting to fall into the category of, uh, I think my selfish podcast that I do where I just want to get to hang out with you and spend time with you. And so it's like, Hey, let's just record a podcast. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, I I have those kind of guests too, you know, just people you want to, you want to chat with and it's a great excuse to do it. And I, I always appreciate a good excuse to talk with you, John. Uh, for sure. Yeah. L- looking forward to the, the conversation. Um, I think off the top of my head, this might be your third time on the podcast, uh, something along those lines. We've talked about your blog, Redeeming Productivity. Uh, we'll definitely uh, jump into that in just a little bit. Um, people also know that you've contributed to the track series uh, that RYM has put together. Uh, you wrote A Student's Guide to Gaming, um, which released this summer. Uh, I'd love for you just to kind of Talk about the reaction now that, okay, you finished the book. It's, it's finally out there. Um, from our perspective, we've been encouraged. It's been selling a lot. I just love to hear uh, the kind of reception you've heard and any kind of feedback. Yeah, I've, I've been really encouraged by the feedback on it. Um, I, I've heard a lot of people writing in to me. I, people who listen to my podcast or, or on my newsletter talking about it. I've heard the ex- most exciting thing is hearing from young people that have read it and been encouraged by it and have been helped to kind of think more, more biblically about this and and have a bit more wisdom in how they approach games. Uh, I think the the coolest thing I was at the shepherds conference, which is a big um, conference that happens at John MacArthur's church in California. I was there last March, right after the the book had come out and I was, you know, poking around the book tent and looking <laughs> to see, see how they're doing. And I, I asked them and, and it sold out um, at the book tent there on the second day. So I, I definitely, I think it's a topic that there, there's a dire need for even more to be written on. And mm-hmm. so I was encouraged and, and thankful to have the opportunity to get to um, produce something on it. Yeah, no, we, we were grateful. And I, I cannot remember exactly how it might've been one of the first times you came on the podcast and somehow, um, the topic of video games got brought up and how, um, you know, involved you were in video games at, at one point. And, um, yeah, just from there, how we, we said there's, you know, not a whole lot that's been written on it. Um, and so, yeah, appreciated your thoughts and, and the approach too, for, for people to know that you're not just bashing video games, uh, that you're highlighting the good and, and giving some cautions there. But it's a helpful, helpful book. Oh, praise God for that. 
Yeah, and I'm not just hyping it because um, it's associated with RYM as well. Um, but it's one we, we want to continue to point people to and tell youth workers and parents, use this alongside students. Students, pick this up as well. It's not an intimidating book. Um, and speaking of books, you have another book that's that's coming out. Um, at the time of this recording, it's not yet released. Uh, entitled Redeeming Productivity, Getting More Done for the Glory of God. Um, and I look forward to talking about that in just a minute, but let, let's talk about your blog, um, a little bit more and, and really just, uh, not just your blog. I, you go in your blog and you say, okay, you've got a blog, you have courses, um, you have, I think redeeming productivity Academy, you have a podcast, YouTube, um, and you're, you're doing all of that. <laughs> Why don't you just kind of tell people a little bit about your blog, um, some of what you're offering and, um, yeah, I'd love for people to know about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny to kind of transition out of the video games thing. Uh, I went from as a young man being very addicted to video games to kind of God getting a hold of me and, and, and realizing, wow, I really need to, I really need to focus my life on something and live with a bit more purpose. And so I got into the whole subject of productivity, reading all the book, you know, Stephen Covey, seven habits for highly effective people <laughs> getting things done by David Allen. So I got into all that stuff. Um, reading all the secular works on it and almost as a way to like make up for lost time. I really felt like I'd wasted a, a, a lot of years of my life just kind of being lazy. And I wanted to, to steward the, the time I had left on this earth um, as well as I could. And so as I dug into that stuff, I kept like running up against sort of like a godless worldview. You know, you, you read these books on productivity and there's all these, these assumptions right under the surface. Like, they won't even come out and say them all the time, but, but basically the assumption is the reason you want to be productive is so you want to, so you can get rich, right? It's so you can um, be successful in your job or, or build a name for yourself. And so there was a lot of really practical, helpful stuff in these books, but uh, I just kept thinking, man, that imagine if we could marry some of the practical stuff with a more thorough biblical worldview. And that's kind of where redeeming productivity came about and it started as, as just a blog. And as the title suggests, I'm trying to trying to buy back productivity from the world because I think it's a Christian concept. I think that we're created to bear much fruit, you know, from the very beginning, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Um, so I, I wanted to try to look at how, what does the Bible teach about personal productivity? But then pair that with extremely practical stuff, like how do I keep a to-do list? How do I set goals and actually reach them? Um, so just just trying to look at all, all through the lens of trying to glorify God. So I started as a blog. Uh, it eventually I started doing a podcast as well, a YouTube channel, and I've just continued to produce different things within this genre. Because again, I, like the video games thing, I just think it's a it's a vital thing. I found it so helpful in my life and I want to try to produce stuff that's going to help other believers live more effective, more productive, more God glorifying lives. So that's what I aim to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and tell us too about, about the courses that you offer. Uh, um, do people you know sign up? Is this a six week, eight week thing? Is it semesters? Uh, just explain some of the, and, and how that ties into the Redeeming Productivity Academy as well. Yeah, so I I've produced I think it's six maybe seven courses, and they're they're usually on really practical things, but again, um, moored to biblical principles. Um, so I have courses on things like uh, setting up a morning routine. I have a course called Power Mornings that walks you through, literally like a lot of a lot of Christians I talk with they struggle with the spiritual disciplines, mm -hmm. and like myself included. Like how do you do those? And one of the things I realized is as much as we talk about how important they are, sometimes we miss the their, 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 their habits too. There's a practical element to making time to do them. And so that course focuses on how do you, how do you wake up a little earlier, have a plan for reading the Bible, um, praying and planning your day ahead, all of that stuff. And so I have ones, I have several of them out there like that. Um, and so those are, they're, they're paid courses because they go a little bit deeper. They give you resources to, um, to put these things in action. Uh, and then the Academy is sort of, um, it's my membership program. So it, you actually get access to all of the courses when you're an Academy member. So it's, it's the best way to do it, but it, you're also in a community of, uh, other productivity minded believers. I think there's 120 
people in there right now. Wow. And uh, we do a bunch of workshops. We bring in different people to talk about different subjects. We have one coming up on on marriage, how, you know, how to plan date nights, things like that. Oh, wow. uh, we do things on, we go deep dive on different software, um, things like that. Uh, group coaching every week. I do that with the people in there. So that's, that's sort of the, that's been my, my main focus uh, with kind of trying to, if people who want to take a next step with me is trying to see if they want to join the academy and and build up some of the practical stuff so they can live more effectively. Yeah. Yeah. Now, and, and I love just, I mean, you share some of the origins of this at the beginning of your book, which is great. Just sharing some of your story and how you definitely, uh, in your words, were not productivity minded. We're actually, you know, anti productivity and we might want to get into to some of that. Um, as well as you mentioned power mornings, which I want to get into, but, um, some of the origins as well. I'm curious because the, the dedication of your book is to your mother. And, um, I'm just curious her impact on this whole, you know, notion of, of productivity and it might've not been specifically that, but just her impact on your life. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. My mom is, is one of the most productive people I've ever met. And, uh, I saw that even from like a really young age. So my father actually passed away when I was five years old and my mom never remarried. So she raised three kids from really little, um, all the way through, um, high school and beyond, uh, wow. by herself. And I saw her and she homeschooled us for the beginning portion of that as a single mother, which is wild. Mm -hmm. Um, but I saw in her how meticulous she planned things, how she planned her day. And as I grew older, she was teaching me some of that stuff. Here's how you schedule your time. Here's how you keep a calendar. And so I really can draw a straight line to some of to the stuff I'm interested in now, to some of the things she inculcated in me, even as a child, even though I was a little wayward in my uh, my teenage and, and young adult years as I sought to... Uh, kind of throw some of that stuff off and and just live for myself. But yeah, my, my mom's the best Diane. She's a, uh, she's incredible. Mm. Wow. That's, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, that's, that is incredible. Um, you, you're talking about how you started to kind of read up on this subject a little bit and, um, had an interest in this subject. I, I am curious, um, uh, you know, what, what are some of the more common kind of insidious worldly principles that, that make their way into productivity, even, you know, for us believers, I know you kind of share some of that in your story as well, but I'm just curious, some of those kind of just insidious worldly principles that seem to kind of weave their way into our own productivity. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of them can be traced back to the definition of success. Um, they will, I kind of alluded to this earlier, they won't all come out and say it, but you know, we, we, as Christians, our definition of success, you could say it several ways, but our, our objective here is to bring God glory with our, our lives. Our objective is to be faithful stewards, right? But a lot of the productivity books that they, they'll define success as, um, material wealth. Um, like I said, like making a name for yourself, but I think a really big one, that's probably very insidious. And one that I've, I find myself tripping over is, that success is finding personal happiness or personal fulfillment. And, you know, we, we know that our personal fulfillment, our ultimate fulfillment is going to be found in Christ. So there's, that's, I think part of why it's a little bit insidious, but you will, I'll find myself often optimizing my life and my productivity for things um, that'll just give me more personal happiness. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I just think that's a very tricky thing sometimes. I remember reading, um, I was reading a book on productivity. I was on vacation. This is several years back. And the author said something like the, the purpose of life is to increase the frequency and intensity of good experiences. And I was sitting there reading that. And I, I remember nodding my head. I'm like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then I shook my head. I was like, what do you know? Reagan, like that's <laughs> hedonism. He literally <laughs> defined hedonism and said, that's the meaning of life. Uh, and so I, I always say, you know, every, every philosophy of productivity comes with a theology. It's going to tell you about why you're here. It's going to tell you about what the purpose of life is. And that is not just like a bug. That's literally 
you can't talk about productivity at a meaningful level without talking about the meaning of life. And that is why a Christian approach is so necessary because otherwise you're always digging through the weeds. You're always have to have your, your discernometer turned up to 11 as you're reading this <laughs> stuff, even though there's really good practical advice, it's just always going to have that latent, um, unbiblical philosophy behind it. Yeah, no, for sure. And, and you, you might've just answered this, but, um, the title redeeming productivity, I mean, that's the title of your blog. That's the title of this, this book. I mean, you talk about how productivity is a, is a biblical notion, um, but it's kind of been captured by the world. And so, I mean, is that the basic origins of your title? Uh, just kind of give us some, some thoughts there. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, that, that's, that's kind of the thought is that it is about buying, buying the concept back from the world. You know, that's, that's what redeem means. You know, you, you, mm -hmm. you pay the price, you buy something back, whether it's a, it was a prisoner of war or, or a slave or something in the ancient world. Um, and I, I think it kind of dovetails nicely with the idea that we've been redeemed, right? Where Christ has redeemed us from the bondage to sin. He's bought us back with, with the, at the cost of his own blood. And that sort of forms the basis for why we even care about this topic. Like I, I want to, I want to be productive because I've been redeemed because my life is not my own. I've been bought with a price. And so I, I think that that's, that's kind of, I don't know if it's technically a double entendre, but that's sort of the two <laughs> sides of it is I think about the fact that we've been, we have been redeemed to be productive. You know, it says in, in Ephesians 2.10 um, about the, you know, the, the good works that, we, um, that, uh, that he would have us walk in. Like that's, we, we've been redeemed and there's, there's work for us to do, but also we're redeeming productivity because we're taking the concept back as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, yeah, you know, so much of what we're talking about here is, is stewardship. And, and you make a statement in your book, um, something along the lines, I think stewardship eliminates jealousy. Um, and I'd love for you just to talk about that a little bit more, how, how stewardship actually eliminates jealousy. Yeah, so it's it can become very competitive when you think about productivity. And even if as you read books on productivity, the thought is, how do I get ahead in the workplace? That's a lot of a lot of it, you know. How do I get an edge? And I think sometimes we can feel that way, even as Christians. Like, okay, how, how do I, how do I be the best I can be? How can I be better than so and so? And so you start to be jealous of other people. But when you look at the concept of stewardship biblically, especially in the um, the parable of the the talents, you know, in Matthew twenty five, where each of these servants or stewards is given a different sum of money to, to steward. Uh, what's interesting is that each of those are at the discretion of the master, how much you get to steward. And so when we think about stewardship and how it eliminates jealousy, when you understand that your, uh, what you've uniquely been given has been decided by God, it makes it it makes it easier not to look at so-and-so and say, I wish I had what they had because I can turn around and say, no, God purposefully, he handpicked these skills, these opportunities, even these limitations that I personally have. And that's mine to steward. I've been given this talent and that's what I, I get to steward. They've been given that and they, they have to steward that. And when you consider that we're held accountable for our stewardship, it becomes almost a relief to think, wow, that person's been given a lot. That's a lot for them to steward and God will give them the grace to steward it. But you, you almost become thankful that, well, I, I just have this and I'm going to do the best I can with it in his power for his glory and know that that's what he holds me accountable for. That's what he's going to reward me for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's well said. Um, and, and there's so much you talk about, and you, you mentioned this uh, a minute ago, but uh, our stewardship and productivity ha has to do with our mornings. Um, I'd love for you just to kind of talk about just broadly mornings and, and why are our mornings so significant in this entire subject? Yeah. I, you know, just a personal note, that was really the, the catalyst for me actually seeing my life turn a corner productively was establishing a morning routine. And so it was kind of upon reflection on my own experience that I realized why it, why it was so important. Um, so 
about it's probably been 10 almost 11 years ago now uh i like well wait i just had my anniversary we were married 11 years ago <laughs> and that's when i started doing morning routines my wife and i um we decided early in our marriage we we said we're always going to go to bed together at the same time if we're both home you know not one of us on a trip or something we're both going to go to bed at the same time every night the problem was my wife goes to bed or my wife sleeps for like nine hours. And so for her to like work and, and do anything, we'd had to go to bed really early, like nine or nine 30. And I don't sleep that much. Um, I just, I've never been able to sleep more than about seven hours. And so we'd go start going to bed at nine and I'd start waking up at like four 35 in the morning and I didn't know what to do. And so that's when I, I started thinking about, okay, wait a minute. I've been given this gift of time. What what are the ideal things I could fill this extra time I have each morning with? And so obviously Bible reading, prayer, exercise, like I just started coming up with these different things and trying like swapping out different, you know, parts of the morning routine to try to optimize that. And as I did that month over month, year over year, I just, it was unbelievable the amount of things I was getting done even before other people woke up. Like I, I was just shocked at how effective I was. And so upon reflection, I realized that that one, mornings give you not just extra time, because there's really no such thing as extra time, but they give you undistracted time, mm -hmm. which in our world is so valuable. Like we're, everything's full of distractions. But if you go to bed a little bit earlier and then wake up a little bit earlier, you nobody else is awake. So there's no, there's no emails coming at you. Nobody's calling you. There's no, you know, kids yelling in the house or whatever it is that distracts you. You have undistracted time and that's a really precious commodity. And you can allocate that towards things like being in God's word or, or, um, or journaling or, or reading. Um, and then also I do think we see early morning devotions modeled in scripture. I, I don't think it's something you want to come down and try to be legalistic on, but you know, I think it's Mark 135 it talks about Jesus, you know, rose early while it was still dark and he went to a quiet place and prayed. And you see several times where he's getting up before people to spend alone time with God. Um, there's several Psalms that make reference to that too, you know, meeting God in the morning. So I just think there's something really special about the mornings and how you spend them that really sets the tone for the day. Like I, I could tell you, even if I did the same things I did at different times in my day, there's a marked difference between the days where I do them as part of my morning routine versus I don't. It just feels like I, I've already won the day before it's even started. So I highly commend it to people who start a morning routine. Oh yeah. No, no, I totally agree. And, and just yeah, point people not only to your book, but then also to your blog, your power mornings that you talk about and kind of walk people through that, that acronym. Um, I'm curious, is there kind of a plan B morning that routine that you have of like, I'm thinking, okay, if you have a sleepless night, um, if you have, you know, a sick day, um, you know, I mean, are you, you wake up and you're sick and okay, it just kind of throws everything off. Uh, do you have like a plan B in place? Uh, That's a really like good that? question. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things I, I tell people is, um, you, it's okay to skip your morning routine. Just don't skip it twice. And I can't remember it's, it's some productivity book where they talk about the two day rule. And the idea is it, you can, you, you haven't broken a habit if you've missed it one day, but when it's two, then it starts to become a pattern and it starts to unravel. And so for me, I, uh, if I, if I had a late night, like sometimes we'll go to a wedding or something and you're out late later than you normally are. I just don't do it that next day. And I don't, I don't feel guilty about it. Cause again, it's, uh, I think about these things, it's easy to be legalistic about them, but they're just tools. These are just, these are little structures we've come up with that help us to, be more consistent with the things that we know will help us to grow in our walk with Christ and, and as people. And so it's okay to skip it, but I do have a modified one. That's just the essentials. So some mornings I, I wake up very early and I don't recommend my morning routine to other people because I do go to bed so early, but I wake up very early and some days I just don't feel like it. And so I, I really enjoy the morning routine. So I, I usually do just want to do it, but I will wake up a little bit earlier or a little bit later and I'll just do my, the spiritual discipline stuff. I'll, I'll just spend some time in the word and in prayer. My longer 
morning routine has more things in it. Like I, I read books. I, I think I mentioned I journal. Um, I actually go through and making it a plan for how I'm going to spend the day, kind of schedule things out. Um, so yeah, I do have an abbreviated version. I think that's, that's probably wise. Yeah, for sure. No, I like that. Just kind of giving yourself the freedom as well. And, and also just, you know, giving yourself the freedom to sleep in and, and not see it as some kind of rigid thing you have to stick to. And like you said, that might could spill over into to legalism. Um, I know you mentioned exercise as part of the, the morning routine. J- just curious, what what do you try to do consistently as, as far as exercise goes? I'm just always fascinated in how people try to, you know, steward the body as well. Yeah. So I, um, full disclosure, exercise is probably the one I struggle the most with doing consistently. But one program I found that was has been really helpful, it's an at-home program. It's by an awesome guy. His name's Don Latour. And his program is called Layman's Fitness. I think it's laymansfitness.com. And he literally, uh, he has a devotional element to it that like kind of thinking, he helps you think about the body more biblically Mm -hmm. and it's all at home stuff. So it's three days a week. It's a lot of real, you don't need that much equipment. It's mostly body weight. You can do, um, I think you just need like a pull-up bar. You can do some kettlebell stuff with it. Like it's very limited what you need. And what I like about that for time is like going to the gym in the morning, like I'll, my entire morning routine has gone. If I tried to drive to the gym, exercise and come back. So I like the at home stuff a little bit more. And his things are only 20 to 30 minutes, three times a week, very manageable and doesn't require a huge investment. Mm-hmm. And, and as you're saying that, I'm thinking, did, did he come on your podcast? It, it seems like yes, you had he did. someone like, uh-huh. okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, point people to your podcast and they can go search and find that one uh, to listen to. Cause yeah, that was interesting. Um, I'm, I'm curious how you typically end your day. Um, I remember a Cal Newport, uh, kind of had this, uh, I, I can't, I think it was shut down complete or something like that, where he kind of thought about the loops that he had open and trying to close those to kind of leave your mind, you know, at the office, so to speak. Do, do you have any kind of advice on how you typically try to end your day? That's a good question. I, I don't have <laughs> probably a very set routine for how I end it. Um, I, I work from, from home and I don't really have like, um, I, I pick a time when I'm going to end. So I don't work all, all day, but usually we have little kids and usually they end the day for me <laughs> <They> <laughs> or my wife says <laughs> I need some help. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I don't have a huge routine. I do. Um, I, t- I do tidy up my work area and I shut, shut the computer all the way down, make sure everything's closed out, but that's, I don't do anything, um, special like that. I remember that, uh, Cal Newport talking about that, but I've never tried anything like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm curious too, uh, kind of, I guess, related to this, what, what does rest look like to you? Um, I know we can talk about, you know, being productive and we need to be productive. And, you know, we've said before, um, it takes a lot of work and discipline to actually rest well. And so just curious if you kind of have a productivity mindset towards resting well. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I, I think it's absolutely critical. I think it's part of our design. We obviously we were made to rest. I think, I remember Jesus saying um, to the, I believe it was the Pharisees, where he said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And I always think about that because, you know, he was answering there, them be like, how can you do these things on the Sabbath? But I always think about the principle behind that, that the, the Sabbath was made for man. We were the gift of rest was part of God's design for us. So we need it. We require it. It reminds of us of our, um, our creatureliness, our finitude that I can't do it all. Um, and, there is a mindset to think about rest from a productive standpoint. Obviously, we, a lot of times we think about productivity and we think that's when I'm working, 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 I'm going. But there, resting is part of that equation. You have to back off. You have to stop thinking about work. You have to stop working so that you can recover from it. But it's even more than that, too, because there's something um, they talk about in uh, neuroscience. I think it's called a, a diffuse state with your brain where it's not focused on anything in particular. And that tends to be where your most creative work happens. So if you've ever like been on vacation or something and like just started having all these ideas, that's what's happening. And if you don't plan that into your life, you're, you're one, you're going to run towards burnout, but two, you're actually kind of hampering yourself. Uh, so, so for me, my, my rest is I walk, I take a walk every day outside in nature. I really do believe that, um, 
part, you know, we're made from, from dust. God made us from dust. I think that we have a unique relationship to the earth, to God's creation. And I couldn't, I can't like quite put my finger on what it is, but spending time in creation with the trees and all that stuff, it mm -hmm. just recharges me. And so I take a, a 20, 30 minute walk every single day, right in the middle of the work day. Um, on the weekends, was, like I said, we have little kids. So most of my rest is just doing stuff with them, which I do. It is, you know, you're wrestling kids, but mm -hmm. I find that incredibly restful. I don't think about work at all on the weekends. I shut everything off and, uh, we, we tend to go to parks, do a lot of nature type stuff, which uh, I really do find so restorative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd love to, cause it seems like something, you know, related to this is, is to talk about saying no. Um, when we're thinking about what, what we, what we can do, what we cannot do trying to rest well, all of that. Uh, do, do you have any thoughts on just saying no? Do you have, I mean, even projects that you're offered where you just have them in a category to where you just don't ever say yes to these certain things. I mean, I'd love for you to speak to that a little bit. Yeah, this is, this has been a lifelong struggle for me to be honest, because I'm a people pleaser. Like I just, I want to say yes to everything. Anytime someone asks me. And I think for Christians too, um, this, the struggle of saying no is compounded, not just with people pleasing, but because we want to serve. And I think there's a good impulse there, right? You know, um, Jesus, you know, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve. Uh, and we want to be like Christ. We want to be servants of all, but even Jesus said no to stuff. You know, he, like he was a man on a mission. And so that's, that's kind of what directs my thinking about what I say no to is having clarity about my mission. And so the more that I've articulated and clarified, you know, what are the things the Lord's uniquely gifted me in uh, with spiritual gifts and with, um, and with natural abilities and just opportunities, the more I've put a point on that focus, the more I've been able to uh, discern what are the projects, what are the things I should say yes to because they're in line with what God's uniquely gifted me to do and things that fall outside of that boundary. I'm much more comfortable and, and confident just giving a gracious no and saying, I would love to do that. It sounds like a great opportunity, but that I, I need to give myself to this right now. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, that I really think it's kind of a lot of times we talk about thinking where a lot of times when we think about saying no, we think we're being mean or we think we're being selfish. You're not. You're you're consciously stewarding the gift of your time. And if if you outsource that stewardship to other people, you're going to run into problems. You're going to get spread too thin. You're going to be doing stuff that's out of alignment with what God's created you to do. You need to take responsibility for stewarding your time. And that responsibility often means doing the hard thing of, of letting people down and saying, no, I, I'm not going to do that. That is, that's not something that's in line with, with what I should be doing right now. Mm -hmm. No, that, that's good advice. And, and look, um, we're about to start wrapping this up, but I'm curious, uh, I had a couple of questions. I think they'd be kind of quick. The, the first is, uh, if you could interview anyone uh, about productivity, who's kind of your, your dream interview, uh, just kind of, you know, shooting for the stars, uh, you know, believer, unbeliever that you'd like to have on an interview. Yeah. Well, if I could go living, living and dead, obviously the easy one would be, be Jesus. But <laughs> I, I do think the apostle Paul, I think is a model for us of, of, of productivity. I actually have a, an article coming out about that very thing. I was kind of going through his, his missionary journeys and all that. And we think about like how he, you, you remember like when, um, you know, he had the vision of the man from Macedonia that said, Hey, come over here and help us. Like it, it's, he's such an interesting illustration of walking by faith, trusting God in all things. But also it's very clear if you read between the lines that he was consciously very effective and efficient with his time. But when God redirected him, he just turned on a dime and said, okay, yeah, God's plans are better than mine. I'm going to do his now. Mm -hmm. But it, with, when he didn't know exactly what to do, he just, he, he used his time well. So I I'll cheat and say, I would, I would like to talk to the apostle Paul. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Um, and then lastly, just, just where do you see redeeming productivity in the next five, 10 years? If you've kind of thought about the future of, you know, the blog, everything, I mean, the, the book as part of that, but then courses, everything. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know what it'll become, but I, I really would like to do more of, of helping people, 
um, more uh, directly. Like I like, I like producing the content and I will continue to do that, but I've, I've just found it so rewarding to work with people closer as I've done in the community and through some, I do some coaching stuff too. So I've thought about maybe doing, um, like a, a coaching program, like having, having certified coaches, things like that. So I maybe go, go that direction with it. But, uh, other than that, I, I would love to just keep doing what I'm doing. Like I, I really love, I, I couldn't think of something I'd rather be doing than to literally write and speak and, and help people directly with time management, with all of it being directed towards using that for God's glory. It's, it's just incredible. So if I'm still doing this in 10 years and it hasn't even grown at all or hasn't changed, I'll be a grateful man. Mm -hmm. Well, just reminding our listeners, the book is Redeeming Productivity, Getting More Done for the Glory of God. It releases October 3rd, I believe. Everyone can go to Amazon, can pre-order um, or get it after it, it comes out. But Reagan, look, thank you for all your work. Thank you again for the, the blog, YouTube, everything kind of point people in that direction as well. Just appreciate all you're doing for the kingdom. Appreciate you, brother. Thanks so much. Thanks so much.